Welcome to Getting Real with Grady Jarrett, where me and my co-host Kelsey Conway talk about everything from football, lifestyle, everything in between. Today we have a very special guest, one of the best linebackers to ever play the game, someone who's very near and dear to my heart, my family heart, Ray Lewis. And here's our conversation with the Hall of Fame linebacker. And now Grady, we're gonna have a couple guests on this show, but I don't think that there's one guest that I am more excited to talk to and have on this show than the guest that we have on right now. And that is the Hall of Fame linebacker, Ray Lewis. And where do you even begin with his career, right? And the, and the legacy that he has, you have been able to be close with him your entire life. How yep. much of what Ray has taught you, whether it's conversations on the phone, in person, how much of where you've gotten today came from the lessons that you've learned from Ray? You know, because it's been so much, you know, almost immeasurable, just because the impact obviously he has on the, the regular the regular person that he don't even know. So for me to have that close relationship with him as a young child to an adult now, um, it's been it's been amazing from football talk, off the field talk. And uh, I think some of the biggest lessons that I've learned from him is obviously just when we got time to put in work together. And uh, I'm sure he'll tell you just, just, just going, we just apply everything that we go through in life through just that pain, that work we put in, in the weight room and uh, just overcoming and, you know, being ready for the next thing. He used to teach us, uh, we used to think we'd be done with the workout, me and my cousins, and he would just throw something else in there. Or, you know, we done did two workouts the day, it'd be nine o'clock, let's get this third one in. Just because in life, he, he always tell you, you never know, you always gotta be expected. And it, it was just so much deeper than football. And uh, these are just the lessons I learned that, you know, 10 years old, 12 years old, we would spring break, we go to Florida. That's what we're doing for the spring break. We're going to work out. So um, just, just things like that has just been, I've been able to apply my life and also know that there's always a deeper spot that I can go to wherever in the world I was training at or, you know, going to practice at because I, my body already been pushed to a limit that nobody ever got it to there before, you know? So, um, so just knowing that you can go harder and just, just believe in yourself, man. And, um, so yeah, I let him talk about it. And, uh, so it's just so much. It's, it's, it's so interesting because, you know, as a, as a child, um, when I, when I used to just mess around with him all the time and then he grew up so fast. Right. And then he turned into this, this animal very quickly. And uh, it was funny because the first time I said, I said, come stay with your uncle. And uh, he was like, I'm packing my bags. And I never forget um, when we started that journey, you know, him with my sons and I knew it was something in his eye that he was not gonna take a break. He would, he would literally give everything he had. And then I would look at it and you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about them bounds and all the things. Mm -hmm. And I and I was look at him and I would say, nah, nah, we got five more. Nah, mm -hmm. we got 10 more, right? Yeah. And every time it was always never becoming comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the lessons that I always wanted to teach Jerry growing up, just like my sons is, don't ever become comfortable because there's always a deeper level that you can go to. But the, but the world is going to tell you that you made it. The world is going to tell you that you're good and, and you can do whatever you want to do. But when you have a one-on-one -on -one battle with yourself, and this is where he became really dominant because I started to see it in him. And so all of the life lessons that I gave him and, and me, the relationship with mama, with his mom, Lisa and, and Mona, and the, the relationship we had, we started to raise him to to become everything that he wanted. And it was my ability just to say, I've done it, I'm doing it. He used to follow me, right? He used to come to all my games. He used to come to all the Super Bowls, all that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm doing, the, I'm doing the opposite. I started mm -hmm. coming to his college games and following mm -hmm. him. And so our families just intertwined so much that our foundation was simple. Our foundation was God, right? The second one was family. The third one was hard work. and. The, the last one was always simple, never become comfortable. And that's why I'm really excited to see this young man um, today the way he is. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. He, yes, sir. You know, we just got um, finished talking to his college coach who 
literally reiterated exactly what you said about Grady, about how he never was comfortable. He was always jumping back in line to get more reps. And obviously the lessons that you've taught him have uh, definitely left an impact on him. So you said that you've been following his games. I don't want to put you on the spot, but curious, is there a specific play in Grady's NFL career um, that you think is probably one of the best? I mean, you've seen a lot of good football. Yeah, but let me let me let me answer that differently, right? Because he'll tell you this, and here and he's probably gonna laugh, but I critique him harder than anybody. Yeah. So so even if he comes out and has his best game, right? Yep. Just like in the Super Bowl, just like in the Super Bowl against against the Patriots, right? Mm-hmm. When he had those three sacks, I was like, look, I, I get all that. But I need you to stay low. I need mm-hmm. you to don't worry about the guy in front of you, and mm-hmm. let's keep going to, go to football. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be it'd be so so critique like we rush him. Like what you what you looking at? Like what your eyes? You you looking at the quarterback trying to beat the man in front of you? You got to right. beat the man in front of you first, and I, then you know. And I that I don't know, but you, the next week, you know, I took that. I think one I forgot one game we was playing. I forgot who we played. The next week we played Seattle. And had a really good game, and um, because and it's just that being being made aware of the smallest things because it happened so fast. But if you because you as a rusher you just thinking quarterback quarterback, and right. but just when you take that time to deal with what's in front of you, it um it can it you know it opens up better better winning percentages, you know, better if you, you know, if you're getting a slide or you're getting one-on-one, you can react faster. So, so yeah, just those kind of critiques like that has um been, been really good for me. So um, I want to take it to you on a personal level. Yeah. So 17 years, man, as a middle linebacker in the times where football was, people would say a little more physical, bigger, you old know, school. Old, old school, school. football <laughs> for, for me, um, for, uh, guys around the league, um, young guys coming up, what did it take and for you mentally, physically to be able to withstand and exceed, you know, in those 17 years, you got over 13, 14, maybe 15 pro bowls and all pros, double digits. How do you maintain, maintain that level of success and grind? And, um, you know, what does it take to, to, to be that? Honestly, um, you know, and it was interesting. I was just talking to, uh, uh, I think, the Tennessee Titans uh, middle linebacker. And it was interesting because he asked a similar question, right? What's the difference? And Jared, honestly, and I've told you this many times, the difference is there are so many distractions that you guys have nowadays that we didn't have, Mm -hmm. right? Social media wasn't this huge explosion, when we were playing football, right? So every day, you you remember it as a child mm-hmm. because when you started coming down the train with your uncle, you was like, oh, how are we doing another workout? How are we yeah. doing another workout, right? And I never got comfortable because yeah. we didn't have time to waste. Why? Mm-hmm. Because the legacy was more important than the free time, yeah. right? Like right now, you know, Every, you know, you, you, you're on Twitter, you're on Instagram, you're on all of these things and you have to kind of manage a totally different world. Mm-hmm. My world was an animalistic world. Mm-hmm. My world was the same world that I taught you in that weight room. Man, we got to give it everything we got. There is no tomorrow. Yeah. Right. And at the end of the day, there will only be certain people that you want to hear your name come out of their mouth. Yeah. The great ones that came before you. Yeah. And that's and that's the difference. Like I set aside, you got to think when me and the family got together in 2000, bro, I was 24 years old, mm-hmm. you know, but my life forever changed. And when it changed, I, I stopped wasting time. I yeah. stopped dealing with people I didn't need to deal with. And I figured out something. I never forget it. I saw um, Lawrence Taylor and uh, we was laughing and joking. And he was like, well, you rough. He, he said, he said, you play the game right now. Mm-hmm. Now you got to remember now, this is me listening to LT say this, yeah. right? And he was like, you play the game rough. And the first word out of my mouth, Jared, was LT, I'm coming. Yeah. I'm coming. I want your crown. Yeah. And every day. So people ask, how did I last 17 years? You know this. I invested in my body. I invested into the business. I invested in not just being a player. I wanted to be a student of the game. 
I wanted to know the whole game. I just told this story on Mike Novogratz's uh, show yesterday about me and Peyton Manning. Mm -hmm. Peyton Manning forever changed the way I watched film by just some things that he said at the Pro Bowl in 97 and 98. Okay. He was he was like, I study you so much. And I'm like, really? What the and, and then I'm saying to myself, I well, I study film, but I don't know if I go as hard as you go. Yeah. Because right? <laughs> right? if so, you're being watched hard, you don't even realize how much how hard you're being watched. You so you gotta realize how now. hard you're being watched. And then when you become your own critic, when yeah. you when you have some of I had some of the best games ever, and I never forget a Jack Dario. And Mike Singletary, I used to come into meetings and they used to be like, come on, man, you graded out almost 100. Like, mm -hmm. you're good. I was like, I don't care. I made one mistake. I, I know the play. You ain't even got to talk about it. So already, I was already in critique mode, right, yeah. on how I can be better, better, yeah. better, even though I had great games. Yeah. And that's why I think the consistency of how I took care of my body, how I approached the game, and how I saw the game, and what I was actually chasing. What I was chasing was being on this side of it. And now being on this side, I walk around and I listen to Lawrence Taylor and I listen to Ronnie Lotz and I listen to all of these great and paid men and all these guys say, the greatest to ever do it. Mm. That's why I did it. Yeah. That's why I gave up everything else. And that's the difference, right? Um, I tell people this all the time. Even, even you, baby boy, you've heard this before. Young guys like yourself in this game have to figure out two things very quickly. The mm -hmm. difference between detours and distractions, okay. right? Because a detour can take you an alternate route. It may take you longer to get there, but it could be helpful. But yeah. every distraction slows you down from the ultimate goal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every yeah. distraction, wow. Is, wow. is there a, obviously Grady's such an impressive guy, but is there one thing that, whether it be what he's doing off the field or what he's doing on the field, that since since you've been able to see him grow up that you think is the most impressive thing about Grady Jarrett? Yeah. Well, see, if you know, if you know his mom, then, <laughs> then it's kind of <laughs> easy, <laughs> you know? So it's um, for me um, because he's, he's a nephew to me. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I have always been impressed by him never giving in to the rhetoric or to what people said or how people viewed him. Um, he'll remember this when we went to Vegas and I'll never forget, we went in that weight room that day and I looked at him <laughs> and I saw him give me this look. And I was like, look, we gonna go through it today. Yep. We're gonna go through it today. But I saw something that continues to this day. Every time he called me, he's always on his grind. And the, mm -hmm. the thing that excites me the most as an uncle is I was the I was one of the ones who breathed that into him. Like, yeah. let me give you this. I want to give you this and I want you to run with it. But the off the field stuff, that's who we are as a family. That's who mm -hmm. we've always been. Yeah. The impact that he makes giving back to people. He was raised that way. And that's exactly who he is. So that that part just excites me because that's who he is. But what shows me that he took every lesson that I have for him is now he is it, it's become his own. Mm -hmm. It's his own, he's his own man. And I and I'm telling you, when I watch him play, man, I'm I'm almost jumping through the screen. I'm almost jumping <laughs> through the screen. <laughs> I just I call him after every game. I give him a text after every game. I, that's what I'm talking about. Let's get yep. this thing done now. Yes, yeah, sir. yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. <laughs> absolutely. So <laughs> now that we have gone pretty in depth on Grady. Now, now the part that I've really been looking forward to Grady, just let me have my moment <laughs> you here. You gotta go do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I grew up in Howard County, Maryland, which obviously, Ray, you're probably familiar with the area, about oh, yeah. 25, 25 minutes from uh, M&T Bank Stadium. Oh, yeah. And in about sixth grade, I started following football, but football wasn't, I didn't grow up in a family where when I was a baby, I was wearing a Ravens jersey. So yeah. I started following the Ravens in middle school. And that was at the height of your career and Ed Reed's career with the dominant Hello Dinata defense. And I will never forget I was so lucky to share this bond with my dad where we kind of started loving the Ravens, you know, together. And you obviously, a big part of why I fell in love with football. I 
got in football as my career because yeah. of my love for it. And a lot of it started with, you know, players, but that's the cool part about the sport is people can have such a big impact on mm -hmm. your, your fanship. And I know you and Grady can talk a little bit more about how that makes you guys feel, but I remember we would get to the games to do the Ravens walk before I would look at my dad and say, dad, we have to get in so that we can see Ray Lewis come out of the tunnel and do his dance. Because if you miss that, it was essentially like missing the entire game in Baltimore. <laughs> so I've always wanted to ask this. How did you come up with the iconic squirrel dance intro that you did? And how did you pick the hot and hair song to go with it? And yeah, if you could just go into detail on how that whole thing came about. <laughs> First of all, thank you. Um, and then it, it was, it's, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do it really quick, right? Because there was a military veteran, um, retired military veteran named Kirby Lee, who lived in our hometown. And he had some, he had some mental issues. And so <clears throat> he took a, he took a liking to me in high school. And he, he used to always just, every time I came home, he used to always dance. He used to always do something. He used to always have a song. He used to always have something for me. And if you see on his arm and on his chest, on his back, he got me tattooed like all over him, right? And so I'm like, so I started helping him out. I started getting him houses and clothes and just different stuff. I just really wanted to help him out. And one day I came home and there was this famous song um, in Tampa called The Squirrel. Right. So he's go, let me see you, squirrel. Mm -hmm. Let me see. You. So, so and it was all type of dances that you could do with it, like all type of dances. Like me and Sal used to do it in the locker room, like just mess with it. Though you used to just play with it. Mm -hmm. And so one time I'm home, one time I'm home and uh, he showed me he showed me his version of it. Right. And I was like, I was like, curve. Who does the squirrel like that? And I said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that on TV. And he was like, no, you're not. No, you're not. I said, I guarantee you I do it on TV. The next week, I went I went into the um, I went into the uh, meeting. I said, Mar Marvin Lewis, my defense coordinator at the time. I said, Marvin, when, I, when I'm introduced, I'm going to do something. When I come out, you cool with that? He was like, I'm good. <laughs> I came out of the tunnel, and I'm telling you, I I was the last one called and I came out of that tunnel and this is when it was like no music at first. Yeah. And I hit that thing for the first time and the crowd lost their mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling you, Jay, I'm telling you, Twitter was broke before Twitter was even out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That it thing was crazy. The emails, oh, he has to dance every week. And, da -da 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 -da. Yeah. and so then this guy by the name of Danny, he used to run out video department and I went up there and I'll say Danny look man if y'all gonna introduce me I gotta come up with a song I gotta yeah. come up with a theme I gotta come up with everything and this is around 2000 when Gladiator had first came out mm -hmm. so if you ever notice when Russell Crowe walked out on the on the in the Coliseum he would always grab dirt grab and put it in his hand mm -hmm. and so that's why my piece of grass was always laid on the side yeah. because I would always come grab my grass before I walked into the arena and Nelly's song came because me and Nelly are really good friends. Mm -hmm. And it was just one of those songs that was really hot, hot, yeah. hot at the time, right? No pun intended. No pun intended. And then it started to morph into this this whole production and then the, 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 the stations, NBC and everybody was like, we want to block out two or three minutes for Ray's dance. We want to put it in the live show. And I'm like, yep. well, you know what? I'm in concert. I'm yeah. <laughs> it's a show. <laughs> and that's, and that's kind of how, the, that's kind of how that dance was created. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I love it. It was to the point where I was bummed when they introduced the offense. I was like, can we just, can we just skip the offense start, and the start defense again. every week? <laughs> oh my goodness. I remember coach used to come to me and say, look, we're going to introduce the offense, but we're going to have you come out last. Okay. Either way, we're going to let the offense go. Then you go come out last. Uh, it, was, it was, it was fun. But I'm telling you the best one for me, um, I think I'd, uh, I'd, I've done a lot of them, but when I came out, Hall of Fame. nah, at the Super Bowl in Tampa, um, Brian Billick, Brian Billick, with he's and he was he was he became a fan of it, so it was kind of cool. 
And right before I got ready to do it, he was like, go show them who we are. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is freaking crazy. Can we go at the Super Bowl and I get to come out the tunnel and do my dance? And yeah, so absolutely, man. Awesome, awesome tribute. I travel to Africa, kids do the dance. I travel anywhere around the world, people know that dance. So it's, it's awesome, absolutely. I may or may not have done it a few times in my living room. Oh, you got to do it and record it. You got to send me that. But but nobody needs to see that. Uh, Hey, Grady, have you ever thought about potentially starting a dance after you get sex? Or are you kind of like, it's not my deal? I don't know. Me and Uncle talked about it. He definitely, we definitely talked about it. I, uh, we did talk about we did, it. We talked about it. We talked about it. I got, I got to come up with something. You know, this might be the year. This might be that transition year. We going to start something new, getting the fans ready. Get them. I told oh. him this. I'm the one showing him this. I said, listen. I said, cool. listen to me. I said, you got to give them something, man. You got to give them something. You gotta give give them the something. people what they want, Grady. Give the people yeah. what they want. Got to give them what they want. Got to give them what they want. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we're going to switch to something I think fans will be really interested in. Um, uh, there's no secret, you know, you and Michael Phelps share a very special relationship, him yeah. being an all-time Olympian. And um, obviously, I know you guys are close. He was at your retirement party at, at the house. So um, when we headed out of mom's house, so he's, he supports you in every way, you know, where you yeah. can. So can you give, give, us, give us a little um, synopsis on, you know, how y'all got connected and, you know, what what you know what you did for him to help him get back to where he needed to be and uh, yeah. performing at a high level and um so yeah just take that one and go with yeah it. man I'm excited I'm excited to see his book um when it comes out you know I just spoke in his book and stuff but we met years ago years ago and Phelps was you know a Baltimore kid you know and he ended up <clears throat> coming to the game or whatever and we ended up hooking up man and I never forget it. The first day we started connecting, it was like, look, we represent Baltimore. Like, we are Baltimore. And that's how the relationship started. That's exactly how it started. And then we started getting closer. And then after games, I would go to his house. And we would just, oh, we just just became brothers. And we just started connecting and connecting, connecting. And then we started to really have conversation with each other about, you know, what the end goal was, right? How, of, of, of the legacy, like what did we want the legacy to be? And i never forget, I looked at him and I said, look, it's t- you will be the greatest Olympian of all time, ever. I'm t- we're not taking those shortcuts, bro. And i never forget, he looked at me and he said, look, the, you, the greatest defensive player to ever play the game. And I was like, bro, we going after it. So man, we started going after it. And then we started to have really intimate conversations about just some things at the time, you know, that he was dealing with um, when it came to depression and different things like that. And then uh, I had read this book by Rick Warren, uh, Purpose Driven Life. I had read that book like almost eight times. And uh, and it's a 40 day journal that forever, forever changed my life. Um, and I told him and I never forget the day he called me. He was like, bro, I'm just going through it. I was like, you got to come to the house. And uh, he came to the house and uh and we went in the back, man, by the pool. And he started telling me some stuff he was about to do. He gonna come back and he gonna do this. And I looked at him in the eye and I said, is this for you? You know, cause if it's for you, then let's go do it. But he was dealing with some stuff. And I said, brother, I'm gonna walk through this journal again with you. And so we started this journey on this 40 day journal um, all over again. And just to hear his excitement, every day he would read a new chapter and he would call me and say, bro, I cannot believe this. And I'm like, yeah, just keep going. And I'm reading it with you. So I'm right there reliving it all over again. So there was this thing that we went through as men, right? That I always say a, 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 a lot of men, their biggest crutch is they won't share their deepest pains. We got to a point to where we started to share our deepest pains. We started to share those fears. We started to share those worries, those doubts, the stresses. And that's when we both, I think, grew as as men to to live life as a king on the other side of it. Because now we started, because man, we started going back at each other and it was so good. And everything that we started to do, the highs, the lows, we was with each other. Bro, come see me, text me this, text me that. Hey, talk to me about this. And to this day, man, we just left each other, you know, 
pumps his past and he was one of the first people to reach out, you know, to me and was like, I love you. Just know that. And we have to create more memories and I want to create more memories soon with you. So that relationship that me and this man has is, is, is forever. It's forever, Jay. And Phelps is a brother. You know, I call his mama, mama. He called my mama, mama for years now. And it's never changed. And they don't look at us no differently, man. So it's a, it's a brother that's forever connected. Yeah. Yeah. From, from your, from your standpoint, Ray, you've been able to mentor one of the greatest Olympians of all time and Michael Phelps, you've had a hall of fame career. You're currently mentoring one of the best players in the NFL in Grady. Do you, does that almost give you more joy than some of your personal accomplishments, the way you've been able to impact others? It is the greatest joy. People ask me all the time. That's a great question, right? So people ask me all, ask me all the time, what was the highlight of my career? And what is the highlight of my life? The highlight of my life is the impact that I have on people, mm-hmm. the things that I can do to give back to, to people, right? And, and like, I'm, I'm, I'm always in a father mentality or a big brother mentality. So what I did, what I, what I do for Phelps, what Phelps does for me, what I do for Jared, what I do for countless other people, that's the highlight because what you do for people is how you will be remembered. Right. And that's that's that for me, just like when I was playing with the Ravens. Right. When you were a little baby. Right. It was me. It was me taking those guys that didn't understand the whole game and making them understand it, making it stupid, simple, but making it fun for them. And then when you get away from the game, I get, oh man, I'm talking about on just a random number. I probably get 75, 80 calls or texts a week from former guys. Thank you for what you did for my career. Thank you. I mean, just just, just last week, um, I talked to BJ Sams and um, the Darius Webb, and they just called me. It was like, "Bro, you forever changed my life. Like you 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 really installed what I what I didn't know I had in me." And so when you hear those things, it's like, "Wow, the career was cool, but the blessing of man is awesome." And so it's it's an awesome thing, man. It's a it's a gift. It's a gift from God, and uh, and I I like exercising it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ray, before we let you go, uh, yeah. I think Grady and I would be remiss if we didn't ask you about a coach who was very instrumental in your career, who's now yeah. going to be coaching Grady in Dean yeah. Pease, the Falcons' new defensive coordinator. So could you just share with us a little bit about why Dean Pease is such a great coordinator and why the Falcons fans should be excited about him leading the defense and what he can yeah. do for Grady? I tell you, first of all, we talk, me and him talking, we text and talk all the time because he's more like a father figure for me. But what Dean did when Dean got to, came to Baltimore, what was interesting was me and Ed was one of the um, few people that he would always call. And he would call me in the office and he was like, what do you see? How do you see it? And I think if you're Atlanta Falcon, what you should be really excited about, Jared, definitely you, is that he gives you the ability to dictate what you do best, like like what counts, right? And so what does that mean exactly? So we went into the last round of the playoffs, 11 and 12, and um, it was interesting because he said, Ray, what are we running? What defense do you want to run? I said, Coach, we got Peyton Manning, we got Andrew Luck, we got Tom Brady, and then we end up having having cap, right? We got all of these guys. I said, three of them, listen to me. We have to play a chess match. You don't want to play them in a cover one. You don't want to play them in a cover three because they know they know those coverages. They know the weakness of those coverages. Let's play them in what we do best. Let's make them go the long route. And he's sitting in there watching film, watching film, watching film. He came back to me. He was like, this is the game plan we're going with. And it was just interesting that him... Marvin Lewis and guys like that, Jack DeRio, who gets it, who understands the player perspective. Dean Pease understands the player's perspective. That's why, Jared, you're going to love playing for him. He's not a guy that's going to rah, rah, rah and curse you. You come to work every day, you bring your lunch bell. He's a guy that's going to look at you that you're going to love playing for. I love playing for Dean Pease for, for one simple reason, because it was a father giving a son the lessons to go just do what I do. That's 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 the way he that's the way he he holds you. And so when you walk in the meetings, man, 
meetings was meetings was different. Um, and I've had some coordinators that was, you know, stressed out and this and that. But Dean, Dean is a calculated person. He is so well spoken. And uh, and it's, I'm telling you, it's an honor to play for him. And that last ride, I never forget in the Super Bowl. Um, he looked at me, he, he said in my ear, he said, he said, General, what we running? I said, Coach, I'm not playing zone. I said, I said, hello to y'all. I'm hurt. We if if I'm going out my last ride, we going out blasting. He said, what do you want? I said, cable zero train. Cable zero. We ran, we ran, we ran cable zero train, Jared. Four plays, four plays in a row. You hear me, bro? But it was the it was the confidence that he had in me from my studying, knowing right that the one pass that Cap had a lot of problems throwing is the back shoulder fade. Right now, if you was playing against a Brady or Aaron Rodgers or Brady, or, or, or Peyton Manning, you can't play that same coverage against them because they're too good at throwing that back shoulder fade, man. So for us to have that confidence in each other, but more importantly for Dean to always give you a like you you're in control of it. He's just there to guide you. And I think that's what Atlanta Falcons uh, fans is re- really going to be excited about. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, um, thank you, man. Thank you. Um, you know, just us having this conversation, you impacted that much more people who are ever going to tune into this podcast. And uh, I'm going to call you later. See you soon. And uh, <laughs> much Let love. me say, I'm, I'm going to say this, boy. I'm, um, I know we talk in conversation, but I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you, mm-hmm. right? Because everybody doesn't accept the challenge. Yeah. A lot of people talk about it. Mm-hmm. But everybody does not accept the challenge. And Jay, since five years old, you accepted the challenge. Yeah. And so now, right, you know me always being daddy somewhat to you. Now, what's the next level on how you get everybody around you to play like you? Mm-hmm. That's the next mission. Yeah. Because Jared has now created his name. Mm-hmm. But now it's time for you to take that defense, take Dean Pease, and take that defense and teach them something differently. Mm-hmm. And no more than... What, what we know, right? You know everything, all right? God bless you. I love you. Call me later. Love, love you, too, you man. All right, baby. Wow, there's so much to unpack in that conversation we just had with Ray. I don't even know where to begin, but I, I think where I wanted to ask you about, now that we just heard how much Ray has impacted your life, I talked about how he impacted my love for football, is you're in a unique spot as a professional athlete where mm-hmm. you you don't realize it. Of course you do realize it, but yeah. everything you do matters to yeah. people that you don't know. So yeah. you, you're taking the field on Sundays in front of thousands of people watching you on TV or in person, you're out to dinner and people see you and it's, oh, it's Grady Jarrett. And you're in a position where you can literally change someone's life just by the job that you have. How, How does that feel to you? Do you enjoy being in that spot? Um, Mm -hmm. I just would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, you know, being able to be, be blessed with this position, I say it's a blessing because it, it, it really is. It's something that um, you, you you dream about. and uh, But for me, it just comes so naturally. And, and, you know, like you said, everything you do matters. And being that person that is the one that's looked to, you know, to bring, um, you know, whether it's happiness, joy, yeah. whatever somebody gets from watching me play football, I have a duty to give my all, you know, and um, and just, you know, somebody listening in here today or somebody seeing me out getting something to eat, like just to have that small conversation, small interaction with somebody. It means the world to somebody, you know, and, and it, it took me a long, long time, a lot of work to get to that point. And it's, and it's not me doing this to get to that. So, I, so somebody can look up to me. It just happened as a byproduct of what God blessed me with. And yeah. Um, I just really feel like it's a it's a it's a true um, 
blessing. Um, it's an opportunity for me to meet new people, have impact in their lives. Like I had to tell one of my um, friends one time, you know, we, you know, just for somebody to go out of their way and say, oh, hey, I met Grady Jer, or or that was a highlight of their day or something like that. Like, that's something that I couldn't even, you know, fathom, like, you know, and um, like, it's like coming out of high school or, you know, whatever, for that to be a reality, man, it's just, it's just, you know, I'm at a loss for words, you know, but it motivates me so much more to be better and to to do right and to, you know, motivate the next, you know, Grady Jared or whatever it may be, because you never know who's watching. And um, that one, you know, that the one thing you do to help somebody else may encourage somebody else to help somebody else. So it's like a chain reaction, man. So um, it's definitely a blessing. There's probably so many people that say when they watch you and they say, I want to be like Grady Jarrett when I'm older. You know, I, mm. I remember when I was watching Ray Lewis, I was like, this guy is what football represents. And I'm 28 years old now and mm. I'm still talking about how Ray Lewis impacted my profession and what I'm doing now. And for you, I just think like, what a cool opportunity and people don't understand sports like you having a great game and the Falcons winning Mm -hmm. the amount of smiles that puts on people's faces and then their moods that just change. I know people can be like, all right, it's just a game, but like, it's, it's, it's so much more than that. It can literally turn someone's day from the worst day they're ever, ever having to the best day. And it's not just what you do on the field. Like I know you do a ton in the community and we'll, you know, we'll talk about that later on, but like you have the power to physically dictate the mood of someone and you know, their the happiness of their day. And I just think like, wow, what a cool opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. The reach that we have as professional athletes, football players, is just amazing. Like I remember going on a USO trip um, a couple years ago. Um, mm-hmm. We went over to like Hawaii, Guam, uh, Japan, and just you know, and visit some military bases and uh, just how in tune people are with you know the game of football and being so happy to meet you. And and I think if if we as players like we would understand that impact we have. Um, more of us will cherish this opportunity a little more and, and and go harder in the things we do because it, it do matter. You know, everything you do, it does matter. Like, just don't go through the motions in life. Like, work with a purpose because at the end of the day, you're not just helping yourself. You're helping somebody you don't even know. So it's like, live your truth and, you know, speak that. And, um, and, and you know, it's the, just like I said earlier, the domino effect of affecting people in a positive way down the road. You I mean, if whether you know it or not, you know, you still, you did, you did some, you did God's work. And, and that's, that's, that's what, that's what it's about. And um, bringing happiness and joy to people and uh, just going out there, putting your best effort in, you know, every game, you're not going to win, but um, as long as you put your best effort, I mean, that's all that matter, you know? So for the fans that are listening, if they see Grady Jared out and about in Atlanta, they can come up and introduce themselves to you. You're cool with that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, it happens. It happens a lot. And, um, I, I, I mean, like, I, I like it because it was a point, it was a time in my life where, you know, you know, just people ain't really re- like recognized like that. So, I mean, I, and I'm not, I'm not, I feel like I'm always pretty open. Um, people around me might think, say I'm a little too friendly, you know, taking my time to talk to people or sign something here and there. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it's cool. People come up to me at the gas station. Um, a lot of restaurants, I, you see me around town a lot. And um, so, uh, yeah, man, come on, say, say what's up. I love it. You're changing people's <laughs> lives and it's, it's incredible to watch. Um, but before I let you go today, I got to mm-hmm. ask you something that came up um, in my head when we were listening to Ray. Okay. He talked about what's next for you and mm-hmm. for you, that's leading the people around you. Right. So mm-hmm. you've already gotten drafted check. Mm-hmm. You, yep. you got your contract extension check. You've reached yep. a pro bowl check. Mm-hmm. What is next for you in terms of what are you hoping to attack and what what's next for you in your career? Um, what's next for me is getting this team back to playing winning football and back in playing in the postseason and reaching mm-hmm. pursuing a championship because I know we got the takes to get there. And um, that's, you know, me that may take me getting out of my comfort zone and um, spending more one-on-one time with multiple guys, you know, whatever it may be, however the team turns out. And um, so me just being my best and, and using the lessons that I know 
to help impact other people, you know, and not just keep it to myself. And um, because, you know, the fans in Atlanta, they de- deserve a great team and that uh, we got what it takes. I'm, I'm excited about some fresh new energy in the building. And uh, like I say, I'm here to serve whatever way I can to help us get back to winning football because, you know, these past couple of seasons, you know, as a, as a, as a, in my, perf- in my personal level, it's, it's been good. You know, I made two pro bowls the past two seasons as all pro, you know, and it's been, you know, that's that's gratifying on a personal level, but at the same time, as a competitor, you had that feeling of you want to win games. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, for me, four and twelve, that's unacceptable. Two seven and nine seasons back to back, that's unacceptable. And um, especially when I know what we got in the building, you know. Um, so finding out, finding that place where we can get over that hump and get get our confidence back, our swagger back, to where people feel the Atlanta Falcons and. Um, I think that we can get there. I know we can get there. And uh, I'm going to do everything within my power to help us get to that point. And maybe a new dance in the season to come. I don't know. See, that, this, now, now that's the real new transition if we, you know, okay. we take it to the new dance part. All right. <laughs> Well, I'll be on. <laughs> well, I'll be on the lookout for that. And uh, I've I've been able to have a front seat of watching you grow from when you were drafted, and just kind of seeing you take that leadership role. Watching you uh, be named captain at the stadium last year was a pretty cool moment. So it mm-hmm. was cool to listen to how Ray's advice has really ingrained in what you do and you know it's not just words you're living it so i think that's that's really that was really cool for me to kind of see the lessons learned from him and the way you guys interacted today for sure well that's it for grady and i in our first episode of getting real with grady jarrett a great conversation with ray lewis great conversation with grady and we look forward to more so thanks for tuning in and listening to us on our first episode of getting real with grady jarrett absolutely thank you guys